11. This is the practice test for chapter 11, 12, and 13. Number one, the main force is responsible for holding potassium bromide together. Potassium, remember, is a metal. Bromine is a non-metal. So potassium bromide would be an ionically bonded together thing. And so you'd say ionic bonds. Remember, ionic bonds are an intramolecular force between the ions and then they'd form a crystal lattice that holds those together and they're super strong. Number two, which of the following has the lowest boiling point? So now you want to take a look at the types of substances and notice that these are all nonmetals and all nonmetals then are held together molecularly by in, whoops, intermolecular forces and the intermolecular forces that you should be really familiar with are London dispersion forces dipole-dipole forces, and hydrogen bonding forces. And of these right here, you'll notice that the every single one of these has no polarity to it and no hydrogen bonds to it because they're all perfectly symmetrical. So these types of forces don't apply. If you aren't sure what kind of forces are together, the steps you should take is to draw the Lewis dot structures of them, or at least a rough draft of them. And so for A, if you draw a rough draft Lewis dot structure, it's CH4. For B, it's C3H8. It's going to be symmetrical. I won't draw all the uh, hydrogens in there. For letter C, it's C5. And then there'll be uh, 12 H's around there, just like that. And then for D, it will be C4, so four in a row, and there will be 10 H's around there. And then for the last one, N2, that'll just be a nitrogen to a nitrogen. But you'll notice every single one of them is perfectly symmetrical like this. And if it's perfectly symmetrical, you can cut it any way, and it's the same on both sides. That means that the only forces that hold it together are London dispersion forces. Remember, if it's asymmetrical, that means that we'll have dipole-dipole forces, or the fancy name for that type of molecule is a polar molecule, because it has more than one pole. So if you look at these, the only thing that governs them, is, governs them are London dispersion forces, and those are decided by the number of electrons in the molecule. And so if you look at this guy right here, it has six electrons for carbon, one for each hydrogen, so a total of 10 electrons, and that's going to end up being like the least number of electrons. And then this nitrogen, nitrogen right here ends up having, I believe, 7 and 7, so about 14 electrons. Those two are your smallest ones, and those will end up being uh, the ones that would have the lowest boiling or lowest melting point. And so the opposite would be true then, the one with the, oh, I'm sorry, it asked for the lowest boiling point. I was reading number three. The lowest boiling point then would be the one with technically either the least electrons, so one of these two right here. And as it turns out experimentally, this one ends up having the little bit lower boiling point. And the reason for that is because this one is such a small surface area molecule compared to this one that the hydrogens no. go a no, little bit further crazy. apart. So how would we know that? The, th this actually is a super tough question uh, because you can narrow it down to these two, but the reason that you know that this one would have a little bit lower boiling point, uh, it actually separates like the fours and the fives on an AP exam. And the, 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 the difference comes down to what's called surface Area. area and the greater the surface area the more opportunities that those electrons have to do what's instant what's called instantaneously polarize or form these London dispersion forces and since these hydrogens uh, stick up from the carbon and make it just a little bit bigger surface area wise rather than just two atoms stuck together it will give you a little bit more surface area and actually make it a tiny bit higher boiling or a tiny bit higher melting point than something.